the show where anything goes. Motivation, mindset, recovery, philosophy, and life. We become who we are through what we experience. We all have a story, and this is my backstory with Josh Boyer. All right, man. There we are. The My Backstory Podcast with Danny Warwick. Am I saying your last name right? Yep. All right, cool. Um, so a little backstory on Danny and I. Um, I shared this story with him on our phone call uh, last week. But we um, <laughs> met each other at a men's retreat. And I wasn't uh, – when uh, our mentor, we had the same mentor, Shems Hartwell, and when he hit me up, I was like, hey, you want to come to this men's retreat? It was like an instant yes. Like, yeah, I'll be there. And then after that, I was like, shit, what did I just commit to? <laughs> um, and I was uh, super nervous. I had no clue uh, what I was in for. You know, here I am, like a guy coming out of the military. And I'm going to this men's retreat with a, a bunch of dudes that do yoga. Yeah. And uh, I was like, dude, I don't, I don't know if this is going to be a good fit. And as the, as the time was getting closer to me going, I was getting more and more nervous. So I had a, a, an entire like exit strategy to get out of this men's retreat should it be absolutely terrible. And uh, the first person I met when I got there was Danny. And it was like, it immediately like dropped my guard completely. The minute I met you, the minute that we like locked eyes, you embraced me, gave me a hug. It was like, dude, this is, this is where I'm supposed to be, man. This is awesome. So it really, it did set the tone for the entire retreat for me. And it was like a a game changer to say the least. So uh, I got to thank you for that again, man. Oh, dude, that means a lot that I was able to um, have that impact on you. Oh, man. for sure, brother. For sure. I'm curious as you say so, that, I wish we could take a poll of all the brothers that were there to see how many of them have practiced yoga before because I don't, uh, although I'm a yoga practitioner, right. I don't know if that's necessarily true if uh, predominantly more of the men practiced yoga or not. But I do okay. think that men that have practiced yoga might be more open to uh, something like a men's retreat. Oh, totally. And I, again, that was probably just my, like the own story I was making up in my head, like all these dudes who do yoga and you know, the, uh, the linen pants and like whatever. And I'm like, Oh dude, <laughs> like what am I going to get myself into? Um, and I think it was because I was asking people too. like, I had never been to Sierra Bell. I didn't know anything about it. And uh, so I asked a couple of guys and of course the ones that I asked were like, ex-military, ex-FBI guys, you know, whatever. Like, oh, Sierra Bell's where all the hippies go and yeah. <laughs> whatever. So, like, I had these preconceived notions before I even showed up. And, uh, like I said, man, I was pleasantly surprised when I got there. And it was, like, uh, it was a game changer. My life seriously has not been the same uh, since I went. And it's been, I mean, for the better. You know, my life has changed for the better. And I, I'm eternally grateful for that retreat and for meeting all you guys and, and these connections, man. Um, so I want you, if you don't mind, man, going into your backstory and tell the listeners, um, you know, a little bit about who you are and a little bit about your life, man, as much as you're comfortable sharing. Yeah, absolutely. As uh, I shared before we hopped on this call, open book, um, I feel like that's a quality of mine that <clears throat> has enabled me to have that effect on men where we can drop our guards and get real. It's just like, I'm totally cool with my struggles now, at least. Um, but essentially my story, I grew up on Long Island, New York and, uh, loving family, but, um, I was really, really into like video games and a stagnant lifestyle. And when I turned 13 or 14, I immediately got heavy into smoking pot and, uh, that led into a lot of other drug use by age of 15. I had pretty much tried everything under the sun. So I was a pretty, um, young user. And uh, that just really triggered some deep depression, some deep, deep mental uh, and emotional issues that led me to actually uh, dropping out of high school when I was 16 with like zero plan. I was just like, I hadn't talked to my dad in like six months. Um, my mom, I had a okay relationship with, but I moved out of my house and dropped out of high school and just started like mooching off of a friend where um, his family wasn't well off or anything, but they opened their doors to me and I was like eating meals with them and, and barely working. I was working a takeout for a Chinese restaurant and all my <laughs> money was going to pot and drugs and nice. I had no plan, man. I was a wreck, you know? Um, what were you running from? Do you think, you know, and the reason I ask is like, I, uh, 
I was always afraid, you know, like when I was a kid, when I was your age, like that age, I, I was smoking weed too, you know, like, you know, 14, 15. And um, even with weed, I was a little like skeptical. And I was like, oh, I'll smoke a little bit, but I'll get a little too paranoid. So I don't want to, and I always had this weird, like, I guess fascination with people like you that were like, that could do all the drugs and like could still function through life and be totally cool with it. And I was always afraid of like losing my sense of reality, if that makes any sense. Um, so it kind of kept me, it sheltered me from like going down, like, cause I had a terrible upbringing. It's like, dude, like go, I could have gone down that path very easily. So what do you think for you? Like, what was calling you? Like, what, what, what about the drugs was like pushing you toward them? Was it just kind of like you wanted to experiment or did you have a tough upbringing where it's like you were trying to run away or what was the deal? Yeah. I mean, my upbringing uh, was, was great. Honestly, um, my parents were super loving and, you know, I had a, a critical father, but I think that's really normal. And I started to ask him what his upbringing was like. And uh, he yeah. felt like that was how he could help me and shape me to be a man that um, was having positive impact in the world. And uh, that was out of love. So I, I was coming from a place of love. And I think what I was running away from was reality. Um, this deep sense of not feeling like enough or worthy uh, as I was. And so it just became like this constant drive to disassociate. And man, did I have some terrible experiences with pot, mushrooms, acid, um, all the likes where uh, it wasn't even very enjoyable a lot of the times, but it was this like, all right, let me get out of myself, out of my skin that I did not feel comfortable in at all. Yeah. Um, and then it was kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy of like, well, let me feel really uncomfortable with myself and my life by uh, taking way too many drugs and um, having these experiences. And so... Uh, before I dropped out of high school, some of the other things that I experienced, um, you know, I was diagnosed with bipolar, um, manic depression. Uh, I was put on some psychiatric drugs and um, I would go on them and then go off of them. And uh, I went to a psychiatric ward for a little bit for about a week and a half. And um, that was a, a terrible experience as well. And so it all culminated to this me dropping out of high school and saying, you know, F you to my family, like you guys made this terrible monster. I just did not like myself at all. And um, my parents decided to send me to a uh, wilderness program. And so I had uh, gotten a call from my mom and said, Hey, your dad's working in the city. Will you come home and, and have a meal with me? And I said, sure. You know, like I miss you. Um, let's have a meal together. And I went to my house and there was these two um, young men, like strapping young men that um, I'm like, who the heck are these guys? And they put me in handcuffs and, and put me in the car and said, listen, you're going to this program. And so uh, they flew me to Utah and I spent two months in Utah backpacking. Uh, I was blindfolded as I was driven to the outback of Utah and I joined a group. And so this is a program called Second Nature where there was a headquarters in Salt Lake City and they were in radio contact with a bunch of different groups. There was a bunch of different um, boys groups. There was a bunch of different girls groups. And then there was also voluntary um, experiences where people would actually pay to go have this backpacking experience where you would go explore the beauty of the wilderness of Utah with like 40 pound backpacks with a tarp with all your needs. Um, and so they were always in contact with headquarters of like water drop offs and toilet paper. And so I would hike like every three days or so and we'd go to a new campsite. And it was always a rotation of like the participants, the boys that were coming in as a part of the program. But it was roughly about 10 boys always and four staff members at a time that would do a rotation. They were there for a week with us. They would then rotate out. And so during that time, the first three weeks was just like, I can't believe this is happening. Like, I, I, I got to tell my girl. Where the fuck am I? <laughs> you know, and uh, writing these letters like, please take me home, I'll be better. And then between that and then like the opposite side of like, I can't believe what kind of parents are you, you guys are sick, blah, blah, blah. And then after like the fourth or fifth week being detached, like totally immersed in nature, uh, 
had this profound shift on me. And luckily I was not on any medications and, and didn't take any medications since. Um, and so I had this really, really beautiful, profound experience while I was in uh, this wilderness program that I stayed for about eight, nine weeks. Oh, wow. And then, yeah, um, didn't see a building man, didn't, you know, like did Billy Bath showers. Um, and I reflect on that with a lot of uh, appreciation because that really, I didn't have a deep connection to nature. You know, that's um, not something that my parents were very outdoorsy. They were very like movie TV oriented. Um, and so I, I cultivated this appreciation for nature and, and recognized the profound peace and clarity that immersing yourself with nature can bring. Um, and then from there, you know, I was 16 and in New York, we have these things called the regents. So like in 11th grade, you take these state tests to then move on to your senior year. And uh, it was March and I had dropped out in November. And so not taking my regents, I was pretty much a year behind for high school. Yeah. And I went to a boarding school where there was in Texas, there was a the blessing that I could do two years pretty much of high school in one, I was able to graduate high school in 07, like I was planning to. Um, but Texas was a, a pretty intense experience. It was around uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, which, um, you know, that program was my first um, program meant for sobriety and kind of community. But it was also a very, very repressive um, boarding school where I wore a jumpsuit for my first two months because I was a, a run risk. Um, you couldn't buy your own clothes. I couldn't speak to girls. Um, that was really tough as a 16, 17, and 18 oh, yeah. year old. Um, You know, there was girls at the school as well, but we were kept separate. Um, I couldn't talk one-on-one -on -one with another uh, student. There always had to be three students. I couldn't read books like Harry Potter or fiction books for the first six months. Couldn't draw, couldn't play guitar. Um, what I had realized in Second Nature in the wilderness program was like, oh man, I love music. Like I can't wait to like um, play more music. And I found out I was going to this boarding school and I was like, oh man, I hope I can get my guitar. And so essentially the idea around this boarding school was like, we're gonna create this bubble where you can't talk about your old life. You can't war story. You can't talk about your old friends can't talk about music. The only music we could listen to was CCR. Uh, <laughs> I heard it through the grapevine. Um, so I pretty much had like one album to listen to while we cleaned. And, um, you know, so there was blessings in the sense that I was able to uh, finish high school. Almost every day I was like playing basketball or ultimate Frisbee or on the track. So I got into my body, but it was really, really limited in the sense of like, as soon as I left there, I did like two months of sobriety. I was going to meetings really uh, frequently and sticking to the program. Um, but it wasn't real because I was in this bubble. And so eventually I wanted to socialize again. And eventually I, I wanted to get out of that bubble and I couldn't handle it. The skills that I had gained or that program was in this bubble that as soon as I got out of the bubble, I started using again. And, um, right. you know, I got into dope and, um, some heavier drugs and I went through a, a terrible dark phase man where um from the age of like 18 to 23 i was in a a really rough place and, and seeking out sobriety again i had moved out when i was 19 i started um, going to college and supporting myself through selling pot and um i was able to make it through college but i was just going through the motions i was really um lost and depressed and luckily i had a um distance through heroin i saw some friends go down some terrible routes and i was like okay i'm gonna put that aside but i still had these mental emotional issues i still had uh this desire to disassociate with ganja with drinking um and and other drugs as well but i put that emphasis on opiates that i was able to stay away from that and um, i was exploring more with cocaine and ecstasy and mushrooms and acid and um, all these other drugs. And so 23, 24, I um, was introduced to Ram Das, Be Here Now. And that was my first spiritual book. And um, I started to embody that. And I was introduced to yoga as well. And so I started to really focus on my breath and I started to meditate and um, seek spiritual knowledge and just started to get in touch with this 
deep knowing that there was more to life, that there was more than just like seek money and um, start a family, which starting a family is beautiful and I have a desire to do that. But I was kind of like, my dream was to be the guy from office space where I just had so much money to where I could just be like, I'm gonna relax and like, <laughs> life is all about relaxing. And uh, that, that doesn't lead to a lot of purpose. So I was very, very uh, lacking in purpose. And so yoga started to make me feel like the fruit of life is how much we can give to others, how much we can contribute. So I really started to face that core issue that I was running away from of like, how can I be of service? How can I actually contribute? And uh, I started to really face this, like, do I have anything to contribute to? Like, do I have any gifts? Do I have, um, any talents, anything that I can contribute. And I started to breathe with that and, and face that. And I recognized that my business degree wasn't really what I wanted to contribute with. And so I got some help through acupuncture that inspired me to uh, go to school for acupuncture and become an acupuncturist and um, become a yoga teacher. And I ended up shifting into massage therapy just for financial reasons. I could get my degree quicker and shift from uh, business like selling. I was selling uh, cable vision or optimum. It's kind of like Verizon. Um, I was selling door to door phone, internet and TV and uh, was not fulfilled with that, even though it was totally paying the bills and it was great. In that sense, I was like, this is not it. So I went to school for acupuncture, then massage therapy, and I became a massage therapist and a yoga teacher. And I found a lot of healing through that, but I kept hitting a lot of roadblocks. And so um, I was dating my current partner right now and uh, I had a kind of breakdown um, around the age of 27, about three years ago. And that breakdown led me to seeking more work. You know, I had yoga and I had acupuncture and, and massage, but I still didn't have like connection with other men. And I didn't even really realize that. I have awesome friends. I had awesome friends, but um, none of us really had the tools to connect on like a heart to heart, gut to gut, uh, real, real level. And so my girlfriend, Madeline had shared Shems's page with me and he was starting the first men's passage course and he was offering these discovery calls. So I was like, all right, I'll just sign up for the call and, and talk to this guy, see what he's about. And he also has um, an acupuncture background. So uh, I was interested in, in picking his brain around that and just see what he was about. And I still remember, dude, the call was scheduled for five o'clock my time and it was like 4.30 and I was like, man, I could really use a nap. Like, what am I about to do? Like, I think I'm just going to blow it off. And for like 30 minutes, I was like, oh, I'm just going to nap. Uh, I think I'm going to blow this off. And I was like, screw it. I'll show up for the call and see what's up. And I was just feeling so tired, so much resistance. And five minutes into the call, after starting to hear what Shems was about and connecting to him, I was lit up, man. And I was like super <laughs> energized and I was like, I'm in. And that was a, I believe that was like a $1,300 commitment, which um, is a big investment for a 27 year old still, um, you know, paying the bills. And, um, but you know what? I was like, this feels really, really right. And I said, yes. And I had a similar experience to you of the men's retreat where afterwards I was like, what did I just sign up for? What am I about to get into? Um, but I felt in my body, I was like, wow, I'm like excited and I'm charged up. Like I felt like I needed to sleep so bad before. And now I'm like, all right, let's go, let's go do something. Let me hit up some friends and go do something. And I felt really, really energized. And so that was my introduction into men's work. And so I'm still practicing massage therapy. I just opened up a practice recently. I'm still a, a yoga teacher, um, but now I have this uh, third purpose of sharing men's work because that was one of the final pieces that I was really missing throughout this holistic lifestyle that I was able to heal from. And that was this male camaraderie, um, yeah. especially yeah. in the yoga world. And throughout my childhood, I would always resonate more with women. I felt safer to share my vulnerability with women. I had that better connection with my mom when I was younger. And I had resistance towards my father and masculinity in general, just because I was like, it's, it's so fucking critical. And it just brings me back to this like core feeling of like, I'm not enough. And, you know, 
women can absolutely relate and hold space and share, but they can never truly empathize with a man because men and women are inherently different. We're equal, but we have our inherent differences. And so this was an introduction to this final huge piece of my healing process of connecting with men on a real level and also learning as you've experienced these tools and these concepts that just radically changed my life. Yeah, totally, man. I think what's awesome about your story too is that, you know, um, one of the judgments that I've had about a lot of teachers that I've had in the past was the fact that they, I could, we talked about it a little bit on our call last week that I want to be able to relate to people. I want to be able to be able to relate to me. You know, it's like if you've come from the bottom and then now you're here like teaching people, it's like you can, you can truly understand what somebody else has experienced. You know what I mean? If they're coming from a place of addiction, they're coming from a place of like feeling less than and like, you know, not having a connection to men and feeling like they've been like around a lot of toxic masculinity or whatever and it just hasn't resonated with them. You can get that and you understand it completely. Um, and I think that makes you more of a valuable asset in the men's work like community because I think a lot of people um, – I don't know if I told you, like when I was reading the, the book, um, The Autobiography of a Yogi uh, by Padmahansa Yogananda, I was reading it when I was getting off of all, all of my opiates. You know, I was largely addicted to opiates for uh, fuck, nine years or something like that. And um, I quit everything cold turkey. I got off all my opiates, benzodiazepines, like you name it. I just quit everything. And it was gnarly, dude. It was like gnarly I should have ever done. Um, and, you know, I had three seizures from quitting everything cold turkey and like, they wanted me to be in the hospital. They wanted me to like, you know, uh, wean myself off and do this and do that. I was like, no, that's not the way I, I do things. It's all or nothing. And I'm just going balls to the wall. Let's do it. And um, reading that book though, uh, it resonated with me. But the part that, that kind of lost my interest was when he talked about his father sending him money, you know, and it bothered me. Like at the core of like who I was, like bothered me a little bit. And the reason is, is because it almost felt like maybe it was a judgment. I don't know if it's a judgment. I think it's maybe it's a reality. I don't know. But like the fact that like he was able to go and find himself because he was supported by somebody else. Mm. And for me, like I want to help other men like be able to find their true identity and their passion, their purpose and like connect to nature and all these other things that are super important. Um, and I want to honor the fact that it's hard to do when you have a life, like when you don't have somebody supporting that mission. When you don't have like somebody paying your mortgage or somebody paying for your food and your sustenance, it's like you're on the grind. And at the same time you're on the grind, you're really trying to get to this place of like elevation, like spiritually. And that's challenging. That's a challenging place to be. And um, it's a truth that I, I, I wish more people would talk about because there's a lot of teachers out there that, that have a lot of good things to say, but like they're coming from a different place because they've been supported to get them to where they are, you know? And these people that they're kind of bringing up in the world are, dude, they're struggling. They're struggling hard, you know? And so coming from where you've come from to see where you are now is a beautiful testament, dude. Like that's a, it's beautiful, dude. It's like more, you're going to be able to help more people as a result, in my opinion, uh, because people will hear your story when you share it. It's like, I think there's a lot of people that either share a fake story or they don't really share their whole story. And people pick up on that. Mm -hmm. They pick up on that, the fact that you're holding something back. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, so I think it's, I think it's beautiful that yeah, you came from a certain place that was tough, that was challenging, that challenged, you know, everything. I mean, addiction is a huge, huge thing, dude. And like, I don't think people understand how hard it is to get out of the grips of that. Um, unless you've experienced it. And what's crazy is your story. Um, the story about Utah, my cousin actually went to the same place you did. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if it's the same, uh, outfit, but the way you described it, was the exact same, uh, same setup that he had. So he's an, aut he's an autistic, uh, kid and he, his parents were looking for things for him to do. So he went to this wilderness camp in Utah and they had the camps all set up where they would switch out the, the stuff. And like, so everything you said was exactly the same way he explained it to me. Um, yeah. but it changed his life. Like he wants to go back there and be a counselor, you know? Yes. Um, and yeah. so it's good when you're sure. That's why I wanted to, to like interrupt so bad. Be like, oh, dude, my cousin went to that, dude. <laughs> um, yeah, I actually had him on the podcast, and he was. We were sharing about his, his challenges with autism, and so he talks about that. Uh, I forget the name of what he called it um, of the wilderness place, but yeah, it was a wilderness camp in, in Utah. So I'm pretty sure it was the same one that you went to. Yeah, 
Yeah, this one was second nature, but I know there's uh, a bunch of different programs in Utah and in other places as well. And that's why I share vulnerably. That's why I actually have now appreciated my story because it has enabled me to help other people. Um, whereas if I came from this perfect background, then I couldn't relate and I couldn't really empathize. And what's interesting about my story is that I actually had to almost self-generate these struggles because that I wasn't set up for that. Like I wasn't in a very abusive household where I needed to disassociate because I was getting beat every day or sexually molested. Um, I literally created my own hell and that was a blessing. You know, looking back on that, that enables me to truly help other people and to be a testament to this work because I really, whether it was self-generated or it was, I could blame that on uh, a terrible upbringing. It doesn't really matter. The truth of the matter is that I transformed, yeah. that I turned my hell into a heaven, that yeah. I still have my struggles, but it's all now with this mindset of like, this is going to elevate my game. This is going to elevate my ability to serve. Um, in terms of the support, it's really interesting that you shared that because I had some like, oh, my dad helped me out. <laughs> no, no, no. It's all, it's, it's all good. I mean, I just, I wanted to, like, I talk about that openly because I know for me, um, and I think it's, it's my own, like, baggage, my own pain, my own... Um, you know, story of like not having a support group, you know, like I didn't have a dad that supported me at all, you know? So it was like everything that I've accomplished, everything that I've done in my life, I've done on my own. Like I've, it's like the house that I live in. It's like, I bought this by myself. Like I didn't have parents to give me a down payment. I didn't have like, I had to figure it all out. And, um, and that's not like, Oh, out of boy, Josh, you did it all on your own. Good for you. It's more like, I think when you're in a position of leadership, when you're in a position of, um, yeah, position of leadership and you're leading men, especially, I think there's a lot more like for me, like there were some officers that, that were in positions of leadership in the military where if they were prior enlisted and they knew the struggles of being an enlisted person, it made them better officers because they understood, like they had a, under, a basic understanding of kind of what we yes. went through of being enlisted. So it gave them, I don't know, I think they were just more respected than an officer that comes directly out of the academy and he hasn't understood the struggles of like what these people go through, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, and I didn't mean to, to, <laughs> to talk. Not, about it. not at all. I think it's a great talking point because like, um, could we shift the lens to where actually the universe was supporting you by not giving you a support system of oh, yeah. down payment and the financial support of yeah. your parents? Yep. Because that turned you into the man that you are today, that you're meant to share your unique gifts. And so I was blessed with some financial support from my father. And I also reflect back on it of like, how did I even get into selling pot where it was just like this natural flowing thing that really supported me financially for many years that enabled me to invest in massage therapy school into uh, the men's work and, and into um, myself. You know, I, I took that money that came in an abundant um, way that also I had an abundance of time. And there was negative aspects of that too, of like doing something illegal that I worried about often and lying to a lot of my family members of where I was generating income from. And so it had its own things, but I also felt really supported by the universe with these opportunities. And I think that when you become focused on how can I contribute to the world, then the universe supports you in completely unique ways where it could look totally like a, um, a curse, like of not having financial support from your parents, but that is actually a blessing where it enables you to relate to men and be like, don't use the fact that you don't have family members financially supporting you as an excuse to not follow your dreams. Like I did this, I was able to buy my own house and work through that. And so you can relate to certain men that are meant to um, be led by you, be inspired by you. And same thing with me, it's just a different story and yeah, i sure. that uni universal support in a, a different and unique way yeah, definitely and i think a part of it may even be like a jealousy thing you know like i wish that like because when i started going down that spiritual rabbit hole um and you mentioned it earlier you know it's like you were you did not 
you know, you don't want to be part of the grind. You don't want to be that you weren't the guy that was like, Oh, I'm going to have the, the family and just, you know, like now you want that. But like, then you, that's not where you were like mentally. And for me, it's like, uh, when I start going down the emotional and spiritual path, I didn't want anything to do with corporate America. I don't want to like, it's like, dude, I don't want to have to like work on this grind, doing something that I absolutely despise, like just to provide like, to like, okay. So like, I'm basically like uh, living for my house. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm working this job that I hate driving in traffic for hours on end to do something that I'm completely uninspired by because society tells me that I should have a house. I should have a family. I should do this. I should do that. And it was uninspiring. It sucked. And so I think deep down, I had like this jealousy of the people that had the ability to seek out the spiritual enlightenment without the pressures of the rest of the world, like pushing on them, you know? Um, and I honor, I mean, I honor either way you come from it. You know what I mean? Like I look at guys, like, I don't really know Shem's whole story of like how he's or wasn't supported, but like whether he's supported or not, he's still a masterful teacher, you know? Mm-hmm. So it doesn't really matter to me. Um, and I, it was a huge judgment of Padmahansa Yogananda, but it was like, I think just where I was at that point in my life, it was just like, man, that sucks. Dude. I, th- I thought this dude was like figuring it all out and like whatever. And I was really trying to understand like kind of how he attained his enlightenment. Yeah. Um, and I think it kind of killed it for me a little bit knowing, like, well, dude, he got to go find himself and be supportive while he was doing it. So I don't know. I guess it's just me trying to honor the fact that the people that um, I use this, this concept on like with social media, uh, there's a lot of people that, will post stuff on social media and it's like a highlight reel of their life. You know, it's a highlight reel of what they have going on. There's guys that are in the fitness community and women in the fitness community that are posting pictures of their, their pecs and their arms and they're all big and buff and, and whatever. And they don't realize, but there's people looking at those images and kind of getting down on themselves being like, dude, why can't I look that way? Like, why don't I look that way? I'm, you know, 30 something years old and you're 40 something years old. You look way better than me. How is that possible? But what they're not telling you, a lot of these people, is they're not telling you the whole story. It's like you're taking 2,000, 1,200 milligrams of testosterone a week. You're doing this, that, and the other thing. And that's what's making you, helping you look the way that you do. And uh, for me, I crave like authenticity and vulnerability. So like when I talk like openly about my addiction issues, like I've said openly before that there were times when I got off all my medication, the benzodiazepines, where like my anxiety peaked so bad, the panic was so bad that I took another uh, pain pill. I took another uh, anti-anxiety pill and I was killing myself over that. Like, Oh my God, I can't believe I caved. I'm such a weak individual. I can't believe I took another benzodiazepine. Oh my God, it's been years without one. Why did I cave now? And I was freaking out. And one of my buddies was like, dude, stop being such an asshole to yourself. Mm. Stop. He's like, you know, at the end of the day, man, like what, the reason I was beating myself up was because I want so bad to share the real story with people, to help people from the authentic Josh Boyer, not the person that like, you know, just get off your drugs. Just don't be a pussy, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm a gritty dude for sure. But I want people to know the real story. Like, dude, I still struggle, man. It's still hard. It's still hard for me. You know, shit still happens. Shit still comes up. Um, so don't look at me and like, think that I'm perfect because I'm far from it, you know? And that's why I wish more people would do like share their real, true, authentic story. Because I think it does the world a better service, you know? Absolutely. And it, 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 it kills the whole, you know, they say comparison is, a, is the thief of joy. And I think if people knew the real comparison of what they're really comparing, it's like, dude, well, this guy's doing a shit ton of testosterone, all these other, you know, growth hormone and this and that. That's why he looks the way he does. So stop beating yourself up so bad. You're not doing anything. You're just drinking water and protein shakes. So relax, you know? Yeah. So anyway. I fall, I fall my into that you know, of the comparison. And I think that's something that uh, Shem's models so well of like sharing his struggles and his vulnerability. And uh, we were drawn to that authenticity because that's something that we know that we want to share. And you can't really, really trust somebody unless they are meeting you with that full story. And you can't from a book, um, from uh, your Instagram or Facebook, like you can't get somebody's full story. So it's really a disservice to assume that um, you know that they haven't had any struggles just because they didn't have a, a similar struggle to yourself. And so right. that willingness, though, to be authentic, to share, to say like, yeah, I'm still struggling, but I also feel like I have gifts and energy and things to share that will help others. And so I find myself in that 
often, but I value authenticity over everything else. You know, like I still struggle with ganja. You know, I, I just made a commitment for six months and right. I don't have anything specifically against ganja and not like touting it like everybody should stop smoking weed. It's, um, it's bad for your whatever aspect. I know for me that it's been holding me back and that I've wanted to stop for a long time, at least take a big amount of space. And I've struggled with that for a long time. And so like I share that authentically because I know that it doesn't take away. It actually enhances my ability to help other people because I'm going through the process on a deeper level. You know, like I've, I've, it's a progress of where it was like, smoking all the time every day to now it's like, okay, I can take weeks off at a time, but now I really want to string those weeks together and have like a solid commitment and clean my system out for a good six months. Right. And so uh, two weeks today is where I'm at with that right now. Nice. And a job. Thanks brother. <laughs> and yet while going through that, I'm still confidently like, I want men to sign up for my men's course and I want to coach other men and, and I have clients and like, I feel confident that their money is going to, uh, is investing in themselves because I've made progress on my journey. And I'm not ashamed to say that I'm not perfect. Yeah, for sure, man. There was a lady that I was going to, she was doing like energetic healing. I think it was called, um, my wife was doing a class with her called, uh, it was energy alchemy or something like that. And uh, so she was doing these energetic healing things like over the phone. And I was like, you know, I'll try anything twice. Why not? You know? So uh, I called her and she actually was really beneficial, man. I really enjoyed our, uh, our conversations. And like, I felt like I got something out of it. One thing she told me though, um, cause I told her, I felt like I was holding myself back from like really like putting myself out in the world too much. And uh, I said, cause I don't feel like I'm there yet. I don't feel like I, I have it all together yet. And, uh, so there's nothing wrong with helping people while you're where while you are still trying to figure it out. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And for her to say that, it was huge. It felt like it gave me the permission to put myself out there a little bit more and to help more people and speak more openly about my own struggles because I was afraid. It was like kind of that like, who am I? Who am I to go out there and, yeah. and share my story? Who am I to try and mentor people and coach people? Like for what? You know, like I don't I don't have it figured out yet. And I felt like I had to reach this pinnacle of success in order to like get my, to, to let myself be heard, you know, or feel like I was worthy of being heard. Um, so I honor you, man, for like really stepping into that, dude. I think it's awesome. And I think the other thing too, with, with ganja and anything, uh, I think in my opinion, as long as you have an awareness of where you are with anything, I think that's the most important part. I think there's a lot of people that, uh, maybe habitual, uh, you know, ganja smokers or whatever. Um, and they're, it's just, it's just a habit. It's a ritual that they're into and they, they just smoke or whatever. They're maybe not progressing through life. Maybe like they should, because they're using ganja to like, kind of like mask a lot of things they don't want to deal with. And I think for me, uh, like I haven't smoked, it's been, uh, at least nine months, probably nine or 10 months. Um, because I will only smoke now if like I have an intention behind it. It's like, I don't want to just smoke just to smoke because it's like, I get it. You know, I enjoy it. I'll, I'll smoke some ganja. I'll read, I'll listen to really good music. And it like, kind of opens me up spiritually. I feel like I feel good about it, you know, but um, I want to have those intentions set before I smoke. I don't want to go into like, just being like, you know, I'm, I'm just smoking just to kind of check out. Um, I do the same thing with pornography. It's like, you know, watching porn for a lot of guys. I mean, it's a, it's a topic that a lot of guys, uh, don't really talk openly about, but it's like, how much are you watching porn? It's like, for me, it's like, it was like every day. I watch porn every day, you know, and, and jerk off or whatever, you know, or if I'm having sex with my wife, I don't know. But um, I started asking myself, like, is that a checkout? Am I using that as a checkout because I don't want to address like the intimacy issues I may or may not be having with my wife? Am I like using this because there's things I don't want to talk about? Oh, I'd love if we tried this. So instead I'll just, you know, watch porn and, and get off that way, you know? Um, so a lot of really interesting things. So I've been really asking myself that with a lot of things in my life, like, is this a checkout or am I like, am I in integrity with this? Um, and there's a lot of things, man. Like when I started really doing that work, um, a lot of things I was realizing in my life were like a huge checkout or a, like an excuse, you know, almost. Um, and I just refuse to do it anymore. You know, it's even like with this podcast tonight, like, you know, I had that procedure today, this morning. And it's like, 
everything inside of me, I could have made an excuse and been like, dude, my stomach kind of hurts. I'm, I'm not really feeling up to it. I'm just going to, you know, let, let's reschedule. But I made a commitment. It's like, no, you're not going to, you made a commitment. You're going to stick to that commitment. You're going to do it. I'm not dead. I'm alive. I'm here. I'm talking. <laughs> so we're, we're going to do it. It is what it is, man. My man. Dude, you really touch on such, such gold there for sure. Like, because it's not about demonizing what, right. what we're using. I mean, there's some things that are, are pretty clear to me. Like, nah, I'm, I'm not going to do that. But like food has been such a big checkout for me. And even healthy food where I, I'll just overeat way more than I need as a way to avoid that confrontation that I know that needs to happen or to face that fear edge. And I also love that like I can help other people while I'm still working on myself. That was something that Ganja really exacerbated that story of like, well, I don't have enough credentials. You know, like I'm not a psychologist. I need to go back to school to be a psychologist first and uh, never feeling ready. And so I noticed that when I was taking breaks from Ganja, I was one instance was when I graduated from teacher training, I was offered a class right away. And that story wanted to come up of like, no, I'm not ready. I, I got to practice. Let me do some free classes first. Like, I don't want to do any classes that I got paid for. But I was just like, nope, I know this resistance. And I always feel good when I lean into it. So I'll take the class right now. and I'll make that commitment where um, I'm sure you're familiar with the burning the ships. You actually might be the one who told me the burning ship story where uh, there was a battle where um, a Navy came in and they dropped all the soldiers off onto the battlefield. And the commander was like, how are we going to win this? And one of his generals said, let's burn the ship so the men don't have that option to back out. Right. And um, That wasn't my story, but I love it. <laughs> so good. I wish I, I could take credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, appreciate your truth. Uh, but I think it was at the men's retreat. One of the brothers had shared that. And I was like, whoa, that's pretty amazing. So I, I had committed to that. And I was like, you got to jump into the fire. And what's great about the authenticity and you helping others while you're healing yourself is that's what people see. They're like, whoa, I get so much out of Danny's yoga classes or when he speaks to me, and yet he's a human being that's going through his experience and growing too. So the biggest gift that I'm giving is permission for people to embrace their struggles and to face their life, to like really lean into what's present and you have this permission of like, whoa, it's okay that I don't have my shit all figured out. It's okay that I'm on my journey. And what, with that acceptance, that's where the growth and the transmutation happens. You can't really do any true growing if you're not accepting the fact that you struggle with ganja or food or, or whatever your current struggles are. But as soon as you flip that switch of like, all right, yeah, this is present and this is tough, but I'm going to lean into it because that's what's here in front of me. And what I brought into the beginning of it is like, now I'm really trusting, even when I don't have the foresight of like, yeah, this is exactly where the silver lining is. I really do trust that all challenges are opportunities, that there's some goal that it's happening for a benevolent reason. And so that's really where I shifted from victim to uh, blessed co-creator, um, you know, just human being with this blessing of life right? Like where life was happening to me to life is happening for me. And I'm, I'm most of it. And, uh, that's, I think that's the best gift that we give to people, especially if people look up to us and then you say like, it is okay. You don't even say it. Like you embody, like it's okay to have struggles. It's okay to be a human being. Yeah. That's, that's great. When, when you give people that permission, you know, cause I think a lot of people, like I said, even with me taking that, Ben's what asked me after all those years. It was like, oh my God, I was like freaking out about it. And just having my buddy, one of my brothers, like who's done a shit ton of men's work. We've never done it together, but he's done a bunch. He's older than me. And just to hear him say like, stop being an asshole to yourself, man. You know what I mean? Like you're still a good dude. You're just going through, going through some shit, man. It's all good. And just hearing that was like, okay, cool. Like it may, it relaxed me. It didn't send me down the rabbit hole of addiction again. It was like, okay, cool. I had, it wasn't even a moment of weakness. It was like, I had to make a choice. And the choice was like, I can be present for my family and take this pill and be present because I can you know, calm me down or I can freak the fuck out and not be able to like even function. So, you know, you just kind of pick your poison a little bit there. Um, yeah. do you out. still struggle like with, uh, your addiction or anything like that? Is it still like a constant, like something that's in your awareness even anymore? 
No, um, at least with uh, heroin was like I dabbled and didn't uh, become addicted. Um, that's another blessing of me being sent away because when I was 16, my group of friends really started to go down that that hole. They were working for a restaurant where, you know, it started with Vicodin and Percocets and, and pills and then just rapidly. And so like heroin really started coming around around the age of 16 to my group of friends. And that's when I happened to leave. And then so I came back and was really lost, but I, I was relatively sober to see like what my friends, you know, like where we're going to drive up to a, a college upstate and my buddy's like driving. And it's the first time that I saw him since I've been back. So it was like three years and he's asking me for like a soda can or a spoon to like shoot up dope and then trying to drive. And I'm like, dude, I, I'm going to drive. Like, so I, I really got to witness how bad my friends were. And I was like, all right, you know, I, I did it like two or three times. I did get into cocaine um, pretty heavily, but not to a point of withdrawal. So I didn't struggle with that addiction. My, my addictions that I still struggle with is, um, emotional more so the ganja and just like this self pity story where I feel so fucking comfortable with self pity to the point of, um, like suicidal thoughts and, um, you know, I, I've really created a lot of space from that, but I mean, that breakdown that I had mentioned that got me into men's work, like I was on a pretty suicidal verge. And so, yeah, my addictions are more um, towards emotionality, food and, and ganja. So I can't um, relate too much with that, that physical like yearning and uh, withdrawal. So that's not really in my um, field of awareness. That's awesome, man. Have you ever read the book, uh, The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks? I haven't, no. Yeah, so like he talks about something that you just mentioned, like a, a light bulb went off. How He was saying that we're so wired in our brains to like kind of go back to whatever is most comfortable for us. So it's like what you were saying with, like with your self-pity story, it's like that's like your brain is just wired to keep going back to that. So it takes a lot of work to get to a point where it's like you change the neural pathways to where it's not even – part of your story or your awareness anymore. And it's funny, like, um, I found my, I think a lot of people do. I mean, I definitely was, I like anger was definitely like my go-to neural pathway, like being pissed off and just like, uh, everyone's against me. So I'm going to fight the world and like just bringing all this drama into my life. And when I finally woke up to the idea that I was creating a lot of that shit in my life, all of it started to fall away. Um, and my life, drastically started to change. My circle started to change. I want to ask you that too, when you were talking about your friends, did you notice when you got into men's work that your, your circle changed? Like when you got sober, I mean, are you still friends with those same people or no? Yeah, I, I am still friends. And, and what I noticed changed was, yeah, there were, I stopped hanging out with them as much. And then when I was hanging out with them, they're kind of like really intrigued. Like, dude, what are you doing? Um, <laughs> different. Like you're, you're not, constantly sad and anger was a huge thing especially in my teenage years where i would just fucking go off and punch holes and walls and uh pick fights and um you know i can really relate to that as well and so after i started to rewire and like really create a lot of blessings in my life and um just embody more joy because i started to really be more on purpose and i think especially for men like purpose is essential you know it's like one of the least talked about health aspects of life where it's like yeah you can eat all the good food drink the right water get the right sleep exercise well but if you don't feel like you have a purpose in life you're not going to be healthy because your soul is telling you like no you got to get on path and it's sending you messages through sickness through um other things paul check one of my favorite teachers uh calls oh, yeah. that the He's the man. Uh, he calls that the pain teacher and, and seeing those as blessings. So I still have a lot of the same friends um, and, and have totally manifested so many new friends. Uh, you being a great example of one of them. Um, but I started to notice that my dialogue started to be different where it was like, you know, I'm not interested in sports as much anymore. Like I, I like NBA a little bit and I'll follow it and have some conversations, but I want to get to the real shit. Like that's what I'm interested in about, you know, like, I don't want to talk about your favorite sports team for more than 10 minutes. I want to know, like, what are your gifts? Like, what are you passionate about? What are your struggles? What are your fears? And like, I want to share that too, because I've recognized one of the best tools is to utilize other people as reflections. 
and to face the fear of being vulnerable. So in The Big Leap, I, I did get to study with Gay and Katie Hendricks. I went after I met Chen. So I was like, dude, who did you learn from? Like, I want to <laughs> yeah, Smart man. <laughs> I want to take in all of, of what you learned too. So I got yeah. to study with them. And um, now Katie, uh, Gay's partner, is like all about fear. Like how do we relate with fear? And I've noticed that like all the best things in my life, I was so scared to do. Teach yoga, first yoga class, first 50 yoga classes, I was scared shitless to go start up a conversation with a woman that I, I locked eyes with at a concert and like I was not a pickup guy. Like it was not in my wheelhouse to go strike up conversations, but I did that and now I, I have a beautiful fiance of, you know, we've been dating for seven years. And um, so like the best things and it's like this, one of the best practices that I encourage is like a daily practice of doing something that you're afraid to do. Like being on a podcast is a growth edge. I would have fear come up for that. Um, I take cold showers almost every day and they don't really get much easier of that initial step. And I always have that like, ah, I could totally turn that warm. Yeah, let's get a little warm. <laughs> but like doing that every day and, and exploring that because when we do that, there's so much gold there. And then it takes us, away from these like unhealthy risks that are not coming from the heart and the soul and in alignment. They're just coming from like, I need to escape, you know, like I no longer drive 120 miles on the highway anymore, which I used to do, you know, dumb shit like that. Like I'd rather go snowboarding, something that like gets me into flow state, mountain biking, trying to backflip off the boat or, or um, cold shower. And so that initiation of like that intentionality of like, yeah, there's a, there's a growth edge here. I'm actually going to lean in to the, to the fear. Yeah. And of course you have discernment of like, I'm going to lean into the fear. I'm not going to look when I cross the street and you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. just have yeah. total faith like that. It's like intentionality. It's, it's really um, one of the best practices that helps us to rewire, to bring awareness into the moment because Man, those habits, they, they're sneaky, man. Like, you know, oh, I thought I was, I thought I was over my, uh, my poker addictions until quarantine. And then I got introduced to like poker on my phone and two months later I'm down money and I'm like, what the fuck? I just wasted <laughs> so much time. And, uh, it was because I wasn't facing this calling that I had for a while to step into my own as uh, a men's work facilitator. Yeah, and as a, a massage therapist and all these callings that I knew I wanted to step into, but I kept making excuses. And I, that's beautiful, dude. I, uh, it's funny that you say like the, the habits will start creeping back in and before you know it, you're like, Oh shit, like what am I doing? And uh, and another thing you said that was really um, piqued my interest was that your circle didn't necessarily change, but the content of what you guys talk about changed. And for me, like, I think once you start doing the men's work and you start doing like work on yourself and kind of really diving deep, you really just stop having time for surface level bullshit. Like, I mean, that's for me, that's what's come up for me. It's like, dude, I don't have time to talk to you about the Dodgers or the, or the Lakers or what. I mean, it's cool. Like you like them good to go. I, I like them too. They're from, I'm from LA. Cool. But I don't want to spend too much time on that. You know what I mean? I want to talk about the, the real meat and potatoes of like what's going on in your life. I want to have a, an authentic connection with you. What I've also noticed is um, when I'm talking to somebody or when I'm engaged with somebody, I can immediately pick up on whether or not that person is being real with me or is willing to really be true and authentic with me. I can pick up on it immediately and I'll disengage. Like if I feel like it's like this it just isn't my flavor, I'm not like you're not being real with me. Uh, there's been a couple people where, uh, my wife will be like, oh, you should talk to so-and-so. And I'm like, no, I'm good. She's yeah. like, why not? And I was like, because I know I've already tried to talk to that person. And when I do, there are certain things that I may know about this person or may not, but I know that they're not being authentic with me and they're not being real with me because I can pick up on it. I feel it. It's an energetic, like, you know, their vibration. And like, it's not, I'm just not interested in like investing too much time in that. You know what I mean? And um, so my circle, I, I would say definitely changed. Uh, as a result of like kind of going down the path, but there are people like from the past or whatever that are coming back in like, Hey, what are, what are you, what are you doing up to, man? Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Oh, you're, you've been sober for how long? Like, how, how are you doing that? Um, and I'm finding ways to really like remove myself from judgment too. Like where it's like, I'm not going to judge people for living however they live. Cause that's, that's where I was before where I was like, look at this guy, like still all fucked up, you know, still drinking like an asshole. Like, fuck dude, look at that guy. And now it's like, 
that's where you are in your life right now. Like whatever took me, however many years it took me to get where I am today, it may take that person a little bit longer. And I forget who it was. Somebody explained it to me in a way that we all have train stops that we get off on, right? So it's like my train stop to sobriety was just maybe a couple of train stops before the guy down there. And maybe his train stop won't happen until the next life. Maybe he'll never, ever get sober. His train stop just isn't going to come up. And for me, it just happened a little bit sooner. And I was like, you know, this isn't, I'm not, it's not adding value to my life anymore. So like, I need to get off right now. This is where I get off the train and I don't, I don't want to be on it anymore. Um, And I forget who explained it to me that way. And I was like, wow, that's brilliant. And that's kind of where I, how I approach people now where it's like, Hey man, like I'll share my story with you. Um, I'll let you know how I got sober and how I got clean and like what worked for me. But in no way am I ever telling you that's the way that you need to do it. I'm just sharing my story and that's it. And like, if you need support, you need a mentor, you need someone to help you. I'm there to support you, but I will never, ever, ever put my own shit on you. You know, you do it on your own time and your own way, you know? So, or put their shit on you, right? Hey, like try to take hey. responsibility for them and try and hero them and do their work for them and be like, dude, you got to get off the train. Right. You, can't, you can't make yeah. them get off the train. And, um, you know, my circle has definitely changed and it's always in flux. And I right. totally feel you on that. Like my circle includes whoever wants to meet me on that real level. And that doesn't <laughs> even have to be like you're off the train. It's just like you're honest about like, yo, I'm fucking on the train and this sucks and I don't know what to do. And like, again, I'm not going to hero, but I'm absolutely willing to have a conversation and share time and energy with you. Um, what I'm not willing is the same thing as you of to, to waste time in story and bullshit and surface level. Um, I'm not about that. And it's like, Not that I judge, I don't judge them for that anymore or frequently as much as I used to. That's still a progression as well. I found myself sometimes getting into judgment, but once you make that connection of like, yeah, they're on their journey, it shifts to compassion and you can have compassion without the need to hero, where it's like, wow, I I see you, um, I see them and like my heart goes out to them, I say prayers for them and um, if they're willing to come up to that level of like, I'm going to be authentic, I'm so, so willing to share space. But at the same time, I know it's not my role to try and save the world. Like my work is really internal and focusing on myself and then letting that radiate out and ripple out. And so we're always radiating, we're always rippling. And so if somebody is seeking and like, man, you know, like I, I really want to feel good in my body and I really do want sobriety and like Josh has been sober for, for this many years. Like it's time to face the fear of admitting that I'm struggling to another man. And that, you know, speaking as a man, that's like such a big growth edge because we've been ingrained of like, pick yourself up by your bootstraps. And even if things are not okay, just act like things are okay. That's where that desire to put on that facade comes from right too much focus on the outside and not enough genuine focus on like how do i get off the train how do i elevate how do i become a creator how do i create the life that um you know i want or at least the perspective you know because like you know i want two million dollars and i want to farm and i want to you know eat off of sustainable land and all these things and hopefully i'm working towards that but i know the real creation is like my perspective and and where my focus is and like you said you don't have to be the hero and i think uh the drama triangle right is the hero the victim and the villain right so it's like if you're trying to always be the hero i mean you're just kind of putting yourself back into that drama triangle you know by trying to save people and i know that like with close friends and family like i was definitely guilty of that you know when i started like eating healthier and started getting clean or whatever then when you see people not doing that it's like I just want to help you. Let me, let me tell you like about these, this whole foods. And like, you know, whatever. It's like, you want to help them so bad. And it's like, all I was doing is creating my own internal drama, my own internal like bullshit. That's like, this doesn't even make sense. I mean, sometimes I think uh, judgment though can be uh, super healthy. I mean, there was a guy, I don't know if I shared this with you, but at the last uh, men's retreat um, that I went to, the one right after you and I went, the first, we went to the first one, then I went to another one right after that. Yep. And, one of the guys there in the group was like, uh, Shem said, hey, who do you judge here in the circle uh, the most? Dude, he pointed to me. 
I was like, ah, oh, he points at me. He's like, oh, that sucks. I was like, why is he judging me, dude? That's terrible. And uh, so, of course, like, I'm a sensitive dude. So I was like, it kind of hurt my feelings. But I didn't know why he was judging me. So I was just like, okay, judge me. Like, well, I looked different. I have tattoos. I don't, I don't know. Like, whatever. Um, and I could have taken that and been like, oh, he judged me. Fuck that guy. You know, like, I, I don't whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I was like, no, nah, I need to go up to him and ask him what that was all about. You know? So I did. So I asked him, hey, dude, like, why? Just out of curiosity, you know, like, why, why did you pick me, the person you judge, you know? And so what he said was, um, he's like, we were doing hoppe, and I brought some hoppe that I had bought, you know, and, um, and I, we were, I gave him some, and we were talking. He was sharing this story with me about being in South America and doing this, you know, ayahuasca and then doing some hoppe with some, uh, you know, indigenous tribes and blah, blah, blah. And I uh, completely checked out. Like he was talking and I was like, I was in law. I was like completely like removed from the conversation. Like I was not listening at all. Um, and it wasn't even like, it, it was just, I was in my own head, you know? And so he said, you know, I was trying to share this story with you and like, you weren't even listening to me. Mm. Like, you weren't even listening to anything. And I was like, Ooh, and I was like, wow. So I, I thanked him. I was like, dude, thank you for like sharing that with me because I think listening is an art. I think the, 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 the art of listening, like it takes work to actively listen to somebody. And uh, I was so thankful that he shared that with me, that he shared like what, it, what that judgment was. And I'm glad that I went to him and asked because like I said, judgment sometimes can be a healthy thing. It can be a healthy like dialogue, you know? And in that case, it definitely was because it really opened my eyes to like how I wasn't showing up. You know, I was like, wow, he was trying to like talk to me and I wasn't showing up at all for him. You know, I was just being in my own little world, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. I want uh, you to share, man, if you don't mind, uh, about your men's group, like what you're doing now, like what you, what you have in the works. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, before I get into that, I just would like to reflect and, and thank you for sharing that story. And thank you for meeting that with curiosity, that situation. So it would have been really easy for you to be like, ah, fuck that guy. Why is he judging? Me? Yeah, he's, you know, and then just come <laughs> back. You know? <laughs> Some stories of like, yeah, his, his hair is stupid and he's a hippie and whatever. Um, but you met it with curiosity yeah. and you actually got like feedback, you know, like that just sounds like some legit feedback to which like, dude, I'm so impressed with the way that you listen and reflect, like just here on this podcast and other conversations and interactions that I've had with you, especially recently. So I feel like by going into that situation with curiosity, being willing to learn and to grow from that, brother, you have, you know, strengthened your muscle of listening and cultivated the art of listening in such a beautiful uh, way. That's so, awesome. Yeah, man, that's really cool. Um, in terms of the men's work that I'm doing, um, you know, I've been working with Shems. I had done uh, the first couple of men's passages as a participant, and he slowly started to invite me more and more into a leadership role with him. And so I'm co-facilitating the men's passages with him. And uh, he also has some mentorship, the Men's Leadership Council, which is a a year-long program that I'm co-facilitating with him and a couple other brothers. He's totally holding much more weight and I'm really really blessed to be co-facilitating with them. So that was um, an invitation into this work. And I had reached out to uh, a brother that I really have connected with and and respect a lot and love. And I had this idea for corporate wellness of like going into corporations and sharing some of the uh, Hendrix Institute, wonderful wisdom, the wisdom that I've learned from Shems and and all other sources uh, to really get into the, the everyday working person to, you know, gain tools to feel more vital, to have healthier communication that would help the, the people individually and the corporations as a whole. And I'm not really a big fan of corporate America. So uh, maybe that's why when I reached out to my buddy, he was actually, I actually, he was like, dude, I actually envision us doing men's work together. And like, I've been so inspired by the men's work that you do. Um, and he was like, I don't want to do the corporate America thing. Would you want to do men's work with me and create a course? And I was like, yeah, I do. (laughs) Um, and so Edward is like, um, he's a little bit more of the yang and I'm a little bit more of the yin, like coming from more of a a yoga background and and he's coming from like a a body weight, um, you know, bodybuilding background. And, uh, we both kind of met in, in the middle, you know, like I needed some more yang because when I was a kid, I was way young, super aggressive, uh, just a, a straight up asshole. And then I totally went the other end of the spectrum, like complete yogi, like everything is fine, you know, spiritually bypass everything. And I can meditate 
through everything and I'm so sensitive and it's, you know, life is so good. And so I lost my juice, man. Like I was like terrible in bed with my lady and like didn't have the balls to take those risks, those healthy risks. And so like, I was like, whoa, I need to like come back into balance. And um, so Edward's coming a little bit from the other spectrum. We both swung, you know, so so often that we're always finding middle but we're very different yet we have these really beautiful core values of authenticity of service and so we complement each other super well and so it's been such a flow state it's been so fun co-creating this course and so it's a course that's really similar uh, in structure to the men's passage and uh, with Shems's blessing I'm, I'm incorporating a lot of his teachings and uh, we're doing a, a nine-week program where we gather once a week for uh, 90 minutes in a circle where we have topics that we go over and we have the physical uh, aspect of it where we're really connecting to somatic um, like feelings. We have the emotional aspect where we gather in, we create the container with uh, agreements for sharing that's authentic, that tries to keep us or that tries that keeps us out of story and into authentic connection. Um, and then we have the mental where there's these concepts like the above the line, below the line concept or the drama triangle concept. And um, so I'm coming with all of these, these tools and techniques that I've had from my unique experience. Edward's coming with all of his. And so we're just combining them in this really synergistic way where we're hosting this nine week course. Um, and of course, we have some. Uh, follow-up calls and, and having the brothers connect and different action steps and a group um, that can engage in between the calls. Um, but we're hosting our first uh, men's course that is um, called the Modern Man Mastermind, which um, he he was explaining to me, like we we're going over possible names and I was like, ah, dude, not mastermind, like mind, I'm such like I was overactive in my mind. I want to be full bodied and, and integrated, right. you know, heart, gut, body and mind and spirit. And uh, he's like, no, but dude, the mastermind concept is when one, uh, two or more entities come together in creation, you create an, a third entity in and of itself. And so we want to create this movement where it can ripple out and we can invite other brothers in to learn and also lead and create this energy, this entity around healthy masculinity and connection and growth and support and community. And so I was like, oh, all right, um, I can get with that for sure. <laughs> and that absolutely includes our full body, you know, the physical, the mental, emotional, spiritual, the mind, the body, the gut, the heart, the spirit. Um, and so there's all these tools, concepts, and this container, this movement, this mastermind that we're creating around it. That's awesome, man. Where can people find it? So, uh, uh, is, it is it a full course already? Yes, yeah, so we're uh, still putting the finishing touches on it, but we do have our website up and we are accepting signups. Uh, we are starting on September 17th, so uh, registration goes right up until the day before, so you have until uh, September 16th to sign up. But uh, we have our website up, which is modernmanmastermind.com. Uh, we have an Instagram by the same name, just sans the dot com. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at I am Danny Warwick. Uh, you can find Edward as, uh, I believe it's Edward dot choice. Um, and I'm on Facebook and, um, I'm pretty easy to find. Nice dude. It's fucking awesome, man. I'm, uh, super intrigued by that. And I don't know if I, you know, just with everything that's going on in the world right now, I don't know if it's the timing is right for me to sign up for it, but, um, I want to hear all about it though, because I think that we need more of that in the world. We need more people like that are willing to like step into that and. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of dudes in the world that are like in need of like kind of that that core connection, you know, with people. Because I think a lot of us are out of touch with it, you know. And I know, like myself included, like I said, like going to that first men's retreat, like how scared I was, and like how all these stories I made up, and all these things of like preconceived notions and stereotypes and whatever. And then I showed up, and it was like a complete like like my mind was blown. Like I, I remember I came home, my wife was like, "Dude, what happened to you?" You know, like I was just like, it was, it was crazy, man. Like I seriously cried for probably um, three to four weeks after I got home mm. and I was, uh, I was sharing that with Shems. I was like, dude, like, I just can't stop crying. You know, and it's like, it's not like a, it wasn't like a, um, 
uh, uh, I'm just blubbering like a little baby. It's like I, I was like feeling again. I was like, yeah. whoa, like I had forgot like what that was to feel. Like I was so up in my own head and up in my own mind. And I like, for example, um, like with my grandmother passing away, it's like she was like my person, my mom, my everything. And when she passed away, like it hurt, like I was crushed, like it tore me up. And I think a lot of it, like I was going through her will and doing all these things. So there was like the business side of things. I was dealing with that, but I wasn't dealing emotionally with how much that rocked my world. And so I came home from the retreat and like a song came on and like, I felt every word to that song. I'm like sitting there crying in the car and like, my wife's like looking at me like, are you okay, babe? Like, and like, so she's not used to that. You know, I was like, wow. Like it really like, it was like a container like came off, you know, like there was like this, this container that was like bottled. And like when the cap came off, it was like, boom, like it's, I was just like open, like opened, like wide open cracked big time. And even telling the story to, um, my buddy, David, the one that told me to stop being an asshole to myself, I, you know, cause he's done a bunch of men's work. So I wanted to share it with him and even sharing with him. Like I was just in tears, like sharing it with him. He's like, dude, you got cracked hard, man. And I was like, Oh yeah, big time, big time. So I think it's healthy, man. I think it's really something that a lot of men need. Um, and some of them may not even be aware that they need it, you know, until the, until they get it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, uh, what else did you notice if you don't mind sharing around like, so you were cracked open emotionally and you were feeling uh, a lot of the sadness and grief from your grandmother passing, but it also sounds like you were connecting more to the beauty of life. And did you oh, notice yeah. changes in your vitality and, and other aspects? Yeah. So like the, the, even the, the song that, you know, that I was listening to with my wife and, and I was, you know, crying, it wasn't like a sadness thing with my grandma, really. It was like an acceptance of the fact that like everything that I loved about her lived within me now. And so like, it was like an acceptance of all of that an acceptance of like, I'm going to, I'm going to miss her, you know, like deeply. I'm going to miss the physical person being here to connect with and stuff like that. But like, I will forever carry her in my heart and there'll be, there'll be reminders that I'll get from the universe. Like that song that I was listening to. And the tears weren't tears of sadness. They were like tears of joy. They were tears of like happiness. And I'd never experienced that before. Like I was feeling every word of the song. I was feeling all of it. It was like, Wow. And I think it was uh, Jimi Hendrix, right? Said that the great thing about music, when it hits you, you feel no pain. And I think it was Jimi Hendrix that said that. Uh, and so Marley. like, oh, Bob Marley, thank you. And um, so I think that was, um, that was like, for it was real for me. I was like, wow, I'm, I'm actually feeling it. So for me, like, uh, yeah, it wasn't the sadness and grief. It, I felt more alive. I felt like I was like in touch with like nature. I was in touch with people. Like I was feeling like, you know, before it was like everything was in my my head. So like, for example, I would get into bed with my wife. And it's like, I immediately want to like, you know, just have sex with her and, you know, and whatever. But it's like, I got home. It's like, I just want to feel you. I just want to touch you. I just want to like hold you and like feel that connection with you. And, uh, you know, maybe some type A guys that are um, out of touch would be like, oh, that's, that's gay. Or that's, you know, what's, what's wrong with you? It's like, no, you don't get it, man. Like once you, until you experience it, you're never going to get it. And uh, it was just, it was a very awesome experience, but I do feel like it's a, a perishable skill. I think it's something that if you don't practice daily, if it's something that you don't practice on the regular, uh, you will fall out of touch with that um, because life, life is fucking hard. That's the reality of, of the world. You know, life is fucking hard. Um, you're going to have pressures that come your way. You're going to have things that come into your awareness, things that happen that are going to get thrown at you and you're going to need to learn how to deal with all that shit in a healthy way. And if you're not in communion with other men and other people that are in your circle that can kind of help support some of that, um, you're, you're going to, you're going to have some, some issues. You're going to have some things that you're going to stumble and fall a couple of times. And so that's what I'll caution other men that are interested in getting into men's work is that um, make the commitment, make a full commitment to it. If you're going to go into it, go all into it yeah. and, and stay connected with the, the guys. Cause I think we're all guilty of, um, connection issues. Most men are right. You have a, you have a connection and then you, you find a reason to kind of go back into your cave, you know, like you just, oh, I'm going to go back to my cave and I'm going to solve these problems on my own. You know, like I, I got it all figured out and, uh, and you pull away. And I found myself doing that a lot, even with our group, you know, just kind of pulling away, doing my own thing. I had things coming up. It's like, fuck, you know, like nobody understands like what I'm going through right now. Yeah. And had I, used my, use the group a little bit more to be like explain, I think those, issues that I was having and things I was going through could have been a lot more um, 
I guess, manageable, a lot more, uh, could have been, a, it wouldn't have been as hard for me to deal with if I would have been utilizing the group that I had, the amazing core group. Um, so that's what I'll share with all, with all the guys listening to this is like, if you get into men's group, which I highly recommend, I also highly recommend that you make a full 100% commitment to it because it'll change your life for the better. So, yeah. Beautiful dude. Yeah. I would love to add to that just of like, I mean, it's inevitable for us to back out a little bit and like yeah. back into the commitment and we just recommit, we recome into it, you know, and we deepen that. And so, yeah, come in, fully participate, fully be there and notice when you are backing out, going back into your cave. And that's definitely the time to reach out and reconnect, to take that fear growth edge and jump into that of like, you know, feeling shitty and I've done this work before. Like, I know it's going to help me, but I just want to be in my cave and like yeah. just shoot that text out. And that's what's beautiful about all these men's groups that are forming these ripples that are being made is like now we have multiple groups to get into, or like you have a network of brothers that you have, it's almost like you're going into battle a little bit together, you know, like the experience that we went into, like especially like going into the woods and fucking screaming our lungs out and like really facing our anger, which is really potent for me or getting naked together. You know, like that's, <laughs> that's a huge, that's a huge growth edge, you know? Yeah, I have a buddy that, that I, the podcast I just released today, actually, uh, my buddy, Chris, uh, on the podcast, he mentions, oh, is this story about you being naked again? Because I, I told him <laughs> I was in the woods being naked. I was like, no, it's not a naked story, dude. But yeah, no, that, that's uncomfortable for a lot of people, man. I mean, people think that like, oh, you know, it's cool. You're just being naked. It's like, no, nah, man, like you're around a bunch of dudes you've never, you know, known before. You don't know who they are. You know, and all of a sudden you're like, naked in the woods, you know, it's kind of like, and a lot of people like hear that story and just laugh about it. Like, what the fuck are you guys doing out there? You know, it's like, no, nah, you gotta get, if you, you gotta be there to understand it, you know? Well, yeah, because you're, you're willing to show more of yourself. And like when you're actually received with acceptance and you're showing yourself, that's, that's such a beautiful healing experience. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And so I, I really appreciate how you share how this men's work has impacted you and this like, your willingness to dive deeper and join another container because yeah, this work is continuous. And, um, but at the same time, this work can also be like so enriching. Um, and you know, it almost reminds me of like that addict mentality, like that type a of like, man, when I just go and, and fuck my girlfriend and like just have sex and, and get the nut off, like, I just want to do that more and more. And I feel less fulfilled every time versus where I'm like really integrated and increasing my capacity where it's like, whoa, this hug feels so good and nourishing. And it's not like that, like orgasmic ejaculation, like, whoa, super high. But it's like my ability to experience joy is like totally increasing and it's like sustainable and integrated and makes my lady feel good. And it's like uh, synergistically nourishing and it's just so much more, uh, in alignment and feels true to me rather than the former. And it is so seductive to slip back into that former because that's what society, that's like the structure that we've been operating in for a while. Oh, yeah, so sure. we're, we're changing paradigms, you know, and we're supporting each other in increasing our capacity to feel joy, to feel sadness too, because that's a part of life. And there's like this beauty of feeling sadness to feel anger in a healthy way and channel that into fuel for our passions and, and for life and um, to process these things. It's just increasing our ability to meet life rather than, than back away from it. And we have so much ability to distract. I mean, we all have computers in our pockets um, we can masturbate whenever we wanted to, or have <laughs> a girlfriend that we can, you know, release stress from, or we have these opportunities to connect with men like dude, you're in California and I'm in New York and we get to connect on this level. Um, or like the ability to, to hug somebody that's going through a rough time or to provide that active listening that in and of itself is, is such a gift. And so, um, yeah, man, I'm really excited to be stepping into this role and, and sharing this work with, with other men because it is needed right now and, um, getting these affirmations and this being one of them, I really appreciate you having me on brother. For sure, man. I think you're a true testament, man, to like the way that I envision men's work going. And the reason I say that is because, um, you know, I have this judgment, I guess, of like 
places like Weight Watchers where it's like you see people who are Weight Watchers there and Weight Watchers their entire lives. You know, it's like, dude, you're Weight Watchers forever, dude. Like this shit is not helping you. You know what I mean? Like you're still stuck paying these fucking people and they, they're not teaching you shit other than to be codependent. And um, so when I was talking about the men's work, I wanted to, to share also that like, it's not a crutch that you're using the men's work. It's a, it's a support group. You know what I mean? It's a support group. But I, I love the fact that like you went to the men's work you did the work and now look, now you're taking a leadership role and your those ripples are starting to go out into the world. And that's what I envision for men's work to be. You know what I mean? Where it's like, you're teaching these men to, to stand on their own two feet, to be truly embodied, like, you know, divine masculine men, you know? Um, but at the same time, not to just be like, you know, where it's like you constantly are relying on investing in all this men's work. I know you'll eventually get to a place where you can take a position of leadership while you're continuing to work on yourself, you know? Um, so I think it's awesome. Yeah. It's really and, awesome. and a testament and a shout out to Shems too, of like, this is not a competitive thing where it's like, no, I want to be the master men's work leader. Like he has supported me so much and encouraged me so much and called me out on my shit when I totally like tucked my tail and, and ran away and started smoking so much more pot and, yeah. and checking out often and slipped into my cave. Um, you know, that's like, a really, really big sign of this work. And that's something that I'm committed to embodying too, of like, I want to lift brothers up. Like I'm celebrating the success of other brothers rather than being like comparison and like, oh man, you know, well, he had it easy because of that or whatever um, those stories. It's like, no, I'm, I'm truly, truly celebrating when men are stepping into their leadership because that's what this world needs right now. Like this needs to ripple out and all men have local communities that they can impact more and um they all have communities that they can lean on as well so that's how we're using our, our resources oh yeah brother well, I, I appreciate you so much man i'm so glad we were able to do this podcast and if there's anything that i can ever do man to help you support you anything man just you know my number call me we'll connect really? and I, I can't wait to see like where this goes for you and i can tell you man just you know from a you know an observation you could see the difference in you from the first time I met you till now. There's a huge difference. There's a difference of confidence. You know what I mean? Like when I first met you, I could feel like your energy was like, was not what it is right now. You know, you can tell that you've stepped in that masculine energy for sure. Mm. Um, and I, I hope you feel that because I can see it. So I think it's awesome, man. Thank you, my brother. Yeah, um, sure. you, you had also mentioned that uh, it might not be the right time for you to invest. Um, we also do want to uh, share free calls and free content as well so another reason to follow us and uh, we do have a call this thursday and then um i believe two weeks from this thursday we haven't set it in stone the second one but uh this thursday we do have a free call so if you want to hop on um the information's on our website for any of the listeners that would like to hop on you just have to register with an email we shoot you the zoom link and uh you can get these experiences for free too because that's you know, it's not all for the money. I believe that there is a lot of value in energy exchange. Um, but we also want to support uh, men that are not financially able to. And we're also offering discovery calls. We're offering uh, sliding scales. Like if you really want to do this and it's just the finances is the only reason, like so willing to work with you. Um, and that goes for, for listeners as well. So check us out, modernmanmastermind.com. And um, we'd be happy to, to connect with you guys. Love it, brother. I got so much love for you, man. I'm so proud of you, dude. And I uh, can't wait to see what's next for you, man. Thanks. Right back at you, Josh. All right, brother. I'll talk to you soon, man. Peace. Thank you for listening to my backstory. Stay motivated and stay connected off the show. Follow at my underscore backstory underscore to be a part of the journey to recovery and to see where your story goes. Or visit us online at here is my backstory.com. <laughs>